Well, good morning, and welcome to anyone who's joining us this morning. This is our live stream service. Greeting to the saints of Southside Bible Church, uh, the warmest. Greetings to all moms who join us this morning. Your design by God is so integral to society and family and church. It's just such a beautiful role that you play in God's program. Jesus entered the world that he created. He transcended all the cultural thinking that really degraded women. And he lifted them up to their value and their worth in his kingdom as joint heirs. And we at Southside, we love the role and design of women and honor and esteem it. So valuable and necessary for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And I'm just so thankful for how you are bringing glory to God in so many ways by the beautiful design by God for, for women. One of the unique roles that God has designed for women is that of motherhood. One of the most treasured roles to me of any. I can't use hyperbole in regards to the effect and the impact that my mom had on my life. I'll never be able to thank her enough for all that she did. Nor the influence and the impact that Laura had on my kids. I can never thank her enough for living into God's design and seeking him daily for grace and truth to guide those little lambs. And who they have become is because of the grace of God and her influence in their lives. And I got to watch this grace on display every day in my house for decades and, and, and to this day as well. And so God's design is just so beautiful. So in this day, we thank all the mothers in this church who tirelessly labor in this calling and in this task to raise a family that loves and adores Christ and gives their lives to make him known. I just treasure it and I miss watching it on Sundays. And so my message to you moms is don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep swimming against a culture that, that degrades and belittles and mocks this role and a culture that fights against everything that you're teaching your kids. And so I just tell you the righteous are as bold as a lion. Keep being a lioness over these cubs. So this morning I want to pray and I want to pray for the moms of prodigals whose kids who have left the faith, moms who have lost children through miscarriage and older children, those whose moms are no longer with us here on this earth, and those who have been hurt uh, by moms. There's a Christ who's better than any mom or child who cares and comforts and carries and will one day heal every hurt and pain uh, for all of eternity. And so I want to pray for all the dear moms of this church. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I do. I pray for these dear mothers. God, I watch them seek you for grace to pour it out upon these children. And I pray, God, meet them. Continue to use them in such a beautiful way to put on display the gospel daily to their children. God, I pray that all the means that you've given, that that they will keep using them and that by your love and grace, you would call their children to Jesus Christ and the ones who are saved, that they will just keep laying a foundation of faithfulness for, for years and decades to come. God, encourage their hearts during Corona where it's just been difficult. You can't take the kids out to where you normally do and all the different battles that they're facing. God, I just pray for our moms. Meet them, encourage them. Let, let today, just, just let them receive honor and encouragement and love from all of us at Southside Bible Church. I pray that the children would, would treasure and, and thank their mothers in such a special way today for, for that, that endless and tireless sacrifice that they make that goes without recognition so often. God, you recognize them. And we thank you that you love what you've designed and what they're seeking to live out. So be with them. Give them fresh grace. I pray this morning. And God, I pray that you will use the word of God mightily in everyone's heart who will listen. God, do what no man can do, we pray, by the power of your spirit, through your word. Amen. 
But whenever I've asked a mom, what, what would you like to hear for Mother's Day? How could I, I bless you and encourage you? And this is what I hear almost every time is I want all of my children to know Jesus Christ. That's what I pray for. That's what I labor daily. And so what I want to give you moms this morning is, is I want to try to help with that. And so kids, if, if you're listening or if you're not, put your toys down. I just want all of you to be saved this morning. If you're three years old, two years old, and can understand anything I'm saying, or, or college age, whatever you are this morning, I just, I've been praying for our children. The revival of 2020, let it begin with the children. And since we can't take mom out for lunch or dinner with social distancing, let's give her what she really wants. And I just want every kid to surrender to Jesus Christ this morning. So we're in a section that is really good uh, for the desire that I have this morning. Paul is so impassioned by grace and mercy that he wants all of mankind to have salvation. There's a gospel that brings peace with God. And and, and at first, you must know you need it. You're at enmity with God. You're born in this world, separated under his wrath by nature. There's enmity between you and God. And in this section, he's just plowing up fields, which are hearts. Just, have you ever seen those plows with the horses? Just, I I never watched Little House on the Prairie because it was when Monday Night Football was on growing up. But I've watched it later with my kids and they they just got these plows and they they take it and it just rips up dirt and flips it all over the place. (laughs) That's what Paul's doing to hearts here in in Romans. He's just kind of plowing. Plowing through hearts. And so what I want you to see is that they're individual hearts. He's going after each individual heart. And he doesn't want you to sit here and keep going, look at how bad our society is. He just wants you to take a glimpse at your heart. And just look at when you're apart from Christ, how bad I am. How bad my heart really is. And Paul is showing Gentiles, you're under the wrath of God. Because you, you've suppressed creation. It showed you the glory of God and you just pushed it down. And any kids, if you're wrestling and you're older, saying, I just don't know if there's a God. I talked to a young man this week and he was raised in it. And he said, how can I be sure? Creation's a great place to start. Just stare at it. And you begin to see there must be a creator. And the plan of recreation to save you is another good place to start. It's the opposite of anything that man has ever come up with. Every time man tries on his own, we get a cult that says, here's how you fix the problem. This is the only religion that says you can't fix the problem. Only God can. And so I just want you to to, to begin there to just see there's a God. And he's revealed himself in scripture. And he has a plan of salvation like nothing else. And then Paul goes after the moralists. He went after Gentile or Jew in verses 1 through 16. These are the group that are not applauding sin like the Gentiles. They're the ones who point their fingers at others and say, look how bad everyone else is. Look at Jimmy, our neighbor. He lies. He uses bad words. He he talks back to his parents. What a bad boy Jimmy is. But the reality is that when mom asked you if you eaten a cookie... Before dinner, you said no when you did. Or dad asked you to clean your room and you muttered under your breath the whole time you did it. And what you point out in everyone else and just say they're all such bad people and you just feel so good about yourself, yet you do all the same things. (laughs) You show that you know what is right, but you don't do it. And you're going to be judged by your own standard that you're holding everyone else to in Romans 2, 1 through 4. You look down on your siblings who are struggling. I'm just such a good little boy. And mom and dad pat me on the head and it just feels so nice. And I just feel like a little Pharisee. It feels nice. God has been so kind to you. Giving you Jesus Christ. And you're being a, what we call a religious hypocrite where you live for the eye of man, and I'm going to call that your parents, <clears throat> and you're doing the same thing in heart and deed. And you're not admitting your sin while you're living the same way and, and not repenting and turning to Jesus to be a savior from your 
bad heart. Paul said, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for the day when God is going to judge you in truth for the way you lived your life. You just keep thinking you're better than everyone else. And you point out their sins. And some of you even point out the Sunday school teachers' sins at our church. You've not let the Word of God point to your own heart to show you your own sinfulness. And you hide from the light of God's Word. And you just judge everyone else, but you won't judge yourself. And what the Bible says, little religious, moral, boy or girl, you need to be saved. You need a new heart. You you can't keep God's law with the heart that you're born with. And so unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And last week we saw in verse 16 that God is going to judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So God knows the thoughts of your heart, what, what, what you're thinking about other people, the things you do when no one else is looking. This is important. What you do when your parents are not there. Nothing is hidden. It's all open before God, and it's going to be opened up on the last day and made known. So this morning, we now turn to the Jew who had so much privilege in verse 17. If you hear the, if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, now he's very, it's a very um, specific group. Uh, 1 through 16 had the Jew in mind, but it's, it's any religious moralist. And now he's really moving his focus to the Jew. And they have what you have. They have a Bible and pastors and parents teaching, Sunday school teachers, rabbis, the churches, the law, what is right and what is wrong. And what they did is they made a big mistake. They thought that having all these things saved them and made God happy with them. Because we have all these things, we're better and God's happy with us. And that's easy to do. Adults do it. Kids do it. One of the easiest things is growing up in the church and just feeling like because I have all these things, God's happy with me. But this morning, what we're going to see is none of that can save you from God's judgment. And another one of my burdens is the big kids, 20s, maybe 70s, 80s, who think the same way. I've just always gone to church. I've read my Bible every night for 50 years. I try to be a good person. I want to make a difference in this world. I vote conservative. I believe in a literal six-day creation. And you think that saves you. This morning, may God plow more in our hearts and fields if that's where we sit. As we turn to the Jew who had so much privilege that makes us think we're okay with God. I, I'm in a Christian home and I go to Southside Bible Church. I, I have to be okay with God. This privilege that God has given you was designed to lead you to God's salvation. It wasn't salvation, but it was to lead you there. And Paul's talking out of his own experience. He had rested in his privilege for decades before he was saved. And I just want to read about it uh, by way of introduction this morning. And if you if you want Philippians three three, one of my favorite sections in all of Scripture, <coughs> Paul says we're the true circumcision, believers, who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. True believers, we glory in Christ Jesus. He's everything. He's our only way of salvation. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. Paul, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. If you want to go to the the hall of fame of flesh, here's Paul saying, I'll blow you all away. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews as the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness, which is in the law, I was found blameless, but whatever things were gained to me, all that flesh and laboring under my privilege in the law for God's approval, I've counted it now as loss. It was literally, it wasn't gaining me anything. It was actually leading me away from Christ. I count it now as loss 
for the sake of Christ. So all that privilege that I had, I thought it was gaining me favor with God, but it was actually leading me away from God in that thinking. And now I count it all as the Greek word is manure. I count it as loss and manure for what? For the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I just glory in Christ. And I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and may be found in him. Here's Romans, what we've been studying. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Romans 2. I don't get a righteousness by keeping the law. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God, a God kind of righteousness, Romans 1, 17, on the basis of faith. There's a righteousness that can make you acceptable to God, and it comes by faith, not by works and your privilege. And so there's Paul saying, all my privilege was manure. It, it just led me away from God because I thought about it all wrong. And this morning, we're going to talk about how to think about it rightly. So Paul's going to take the mask off the confident religionist. And my question is, why so much time? It's hard preaching through Romans 2. It just keeps plowing, and I think I can't hurt anymore. And he just got me again this week, and I looked ahead to next week, and I'm going to get punished again. Paul spends half as much time on the moralist than the heathen of chapter 1. More time in the sanctuary than in the slum. Why would he do that? I'll tell you this. Sinners tend to repent quicker. Where the moralists and the good people, it seems like there's just this ability to just keep blocking light and truth and to say this is for someone else. I wish this guy would have been here this morning. And there's just there's such a strength to a hypocrite that you just got to keep shooting and plowing, <laughs> saying, God, break through. J.C. Ryle said, outright rebellion to God has slain its thousands in hell, while religion and morality have slain its tens of thousands. Many more are going to go to hell with all their morality and all their goodness and all their privilege, and it never led them to Christ. So my prayer this morning is that God would plow in our religious hearts that have not been filled with Christ by faith this morning. And so here's your outline. This morning, we're going to look at three considerations to expose the religious hypocrite. The reason, verses 17 through 20. The reality in verses 21 through 22. And the result in verses 23 through 24. So let's begin with the reason. Look with me in verse 17. <clears throat> but if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God. So I just want to start with, but if. If, you, it's always in the Greek, it's if, then. And so Paul doesn't give a then until verse 21, where he says, therefore, you therefore, and he's going to talk about teaching another, do you teach yourself? So this morning, if you have privilege, and you do, Jewish nation, like no other nation, He's not degrading what they had. He's exalting it. You have true advantages, Jew. Paul is not downplaying him in any way. But he will ask, what have you done with your privilege? And in our passage in verse 24, he'll say, you know what you did with your privilege? You dishonored God. You, did, you took all that privilege and you dishonored God. That isn't what you do with privilege. And as we see this played out daily in our land, all the privileges that we possess in our churches in America, and we have dishonored God with it. Because we didn't get saved by it. The land of the free in slavery to sin. There's so many sitting in our churches, even this morning, who are slaves to sin, and they got their head on the pillow of privilege. That is what these Jews had done. They rested in their privileges, but they did not rest in Christ and this gospel that Paul's going to labor for hard in Romans. So you have a special status. You have the name Jew. The unique distinction, this title Jew speaks of their historical election by God. He called them out. He chose them. He called them out, a, a nation, a kingdom of priests. 
a nation that had relationship with Yahweh himself. They had the revealed will of God. They possessed Torah. So instead of just general revelation, they had special revelation of God's heart and will to the people. To be a Jew was special. God marked them out with a special identity, a special revelation, a special place among all the nations, something very honorable. Their their heritage is magnificent. It was just great privilege to be a Jew. And Paul's going to give us two lists of four things, the privilege of being a Jew, and then the presentation of that privilege to other people. And so I want to look at these two lists. First, (laughs) they rely upon the law. I love that. It was the word when they would confess their sins on on an animal sacrifice, they would lean upon it. And it's the same word as you would lean and rest upon the law. Your, Your hope was in the law. Psalm 147, verse 19. He declares his words to Jacob. God does his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his ordinance, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. They know the word of God. They know his ordinances, Israel and Romans three, two, he says they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And I'm afraid that so many uh, have Bibles in this land and it's no different than putting your hope just in having a Bible. We take for granted what we have. We have the, the revealing of God's salvation in these Bibles. It's, it's one of the greatest privileges anyone could ever own. And they sit on our desk or bookshelves. We, we, we have the Bible with God's salvation revealed. Such a privilege. And we boast in God opposite of the pagan worship of their time, all the pagan worship of the, of the lands and the world and the different countries. But you, Israel, you glory in God. Jeremiah 9, 23, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boasts of this, that he understands and knows me that I'm the Lord who exercises love and kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And so you boast in God. You're different than the nations. And I'd say we're different is in America in God we trust. And we close every speech in the Oval Office with God bless America. In Deuteronomy, all the children were taught at a young age here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This was a nation that boasted in God. And then thirdly, you know his will. Uh, And in the Greek, it's the will with a definite article. What is the will? It's the will of God. You, You don't realize what you possess is the will of God. It's not just general revelation. You have special revelation You know God's will in Torah and that you could walk in his ways. The creator of the universe has revealed himself and we know Jews, how we should live before him. The Jews knew the right way to live before God. What a privilege to have the revelation, special revelation of God. And fourthly, you approve the things that are essential. That's that dokimos, that that word for testing metal and putting it in the fire. You you can test and approve the things that are essential. You can know God's will and discern right and wrong. And even more, you can discern the things that are excellent. Philippians 1.10, that you may, same word, approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. So the the Jewish people had the ability through the word of God to to, uh, approve what is excellent and what was essential to life. And then he closes it out with this little clause, being instructed out of the law. And the Greek word for being instructed is katecheo, where we get the word catechism. And it's teaching by repetition, the, the doctrine, the truth of God. And so you, this is the the light that you have. You're taught by God's law, the revelation of his will, and you're you're the people of the book. The synagogue, you hear the law taught. You're instructed by your parents and priests and rabbis. Oh, the privilege of being a Jew. 
Paul told Timothy, you were instructed by your mother and grandmother out of the Old Testament about Jesus Christ and salvation. And so I guess what I would say this morning is any, any young kid, what, what I am saying now through Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is don't stop with your privilege. Don't be happy just that you have Christian moms and dads in a Christian church and Bible studies every night. I'll, I'll beg you, don't just be happy with that. That cannot save you. It can only condemn you if you don't listen to what's being taught to show you, I can't be good enough. My heart is black. I can't change my nature. I can't quit hating my brother or sister. I just can't stop. And therefore, would you flee to Jesus Christ who's able to save you and give you a new heart? And so that is what all this privilege is, is to show you you can't do a chin up and be good enough to get God to, to love you. You have to to come to Jesus Christ now with nothing and believe only in his work on the cross and what he did. Second list. This is how they dealt with other people. So this, this is again, they're being commended for this. You have, you have all this privilege and now your calling with this privilege was to go shine the light. Go let people know about God. So positive. Once again, you're, you're shining the light the way that you're supposed to. You, you have a responsibility to instruct other people in the light. They don't have this. So let's look at the four things. What do they do? You're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. The Greek word is patho, where we get the word pathos. You, you have passion to go be a guide to everyone who's blind, to tell them the truth. Isaiah 42, the servant of Yahweh, that there'll be light and it will open blind eyes. Go, go shine. Shine the truth. That is what Israel was supposed to be. They were to be a guide to those who were blind with the revelation that they had received from God. And secondly, you're to be a light to those who are in darkness. And who was in darkness? The Gentiles. They were to go and be a light to them, to proclaim God's word to those without special revelation. Isaiah 2, they're streaming into Zion to be instructed out of his law. They're, they're coming, shine the light, tell them the truth of special revelation. And therefore, thirdly, you're a corrector of the foolish. And this was a word that was used to correct children and to, to discipline them. Those who were deficient in moral and spiritual understanding, you were to come and, and teach them and teach the babes what they lack. And then uh, you're to be a didaskalos, a teacher of the immature. You're to disciple the new converts to Judaism. There were Gentile converts all the time and they were called proselytes. And, the, and you're to teach them Torah and, and give them the milk of the word. And so keep instructing and being teachers of Torah. And then this clause at the end of this, these four is having the law, uh, having in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. And so guys, this is a positive thing. None of this is negative in itself. In fact, most of us would claim for this to be true of ourselves. We love the word of God. We catechize our children. We teach our friends. We instruct families. So why is this going to bring us under condemnation? There's such good things. What, what's wrong with such privilege? Well, I'll tell you this. There's nothing wrong with it until it meets with pride until it meets with a stubborn and a rebellious heart. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with the privilege. But when that privilege comes to our little stubborn hearts that are prideful and self-righteous and, and say, look, I'm a good person. I have all these things. God loves me. He must really think a lot of me. That's when it becomes a problem. <laughs> Thinking you're privileged and therefore you're favored with God for having privilege. You're, you're better than those who don't. I'm better than all these Gentile dogs. I'm better than all the liberals. Something special about me. We're superior. And you start believing it. You've never heard that, huh? We're reformed. Everyone else, low lives, conservative. We're truly the only people in the world who know modesty. We hold to the Westminster Confession. I follow John MacArthur. I follow Spurgeon. I go after the old Heidelberg. 
I'm from garb. I'm from fire. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a homeschooler. I believe in courtship. And the list goes on and on and on. And this gives me privilege and makes me better than anyone else. And these little Pharisees just rise up and look down on anyone else. So you get a glimpse of your own heart. I remember hearing of Spurgeon or I think it was Spurgeon or Bunyan, but they were walking down the street and there was a, a, a bum drunk and passed out. And he said, oh, if I could trade hearts with him, I would be better off. That he, that's the kind of heart that Paul's seeking in Romans 2 through 3, not the self-righteous one that looks down on everyone else and says, what a good boy am I. So let not your privilege keep you from Christ. That's my bottom line. Don't let privilege keep you from the sweet Savior. Because none of this is going to matter to God if you, next week if you don't have a circumcised heart. And when you stand before Him, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you, when you stand there, privilege cannot get you through that day Privilege was to lead you to a Savior because you're undone and He's the only remedy and the only help for your soul. So guys, there's the reason for the religious hypocrite. He has all this privilege and He's to shine it and be a corrector of the foolish. But now I want to look at what's the reality, what's the problem here this morning, and we'll look at that in verses 21 and 22. You, therefore, who teach another... Do you not teach yourself? One of the most powerful passages in Scripture for anyone who's a teacher of God's Word. You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? Great for parents. You instruct others in the Word of God. You've taught children Sunday school for 40 years. You can tell everyone else how to do it. You can call your friends and tell them how to do it. You know hermeneutics. You're just an expositor. But do you instruct yourself? Do you take this special privilege of special revelation and shine it only on others? Or do you let it go upon your own heart? And, and do you do it? And that's what he's going to show them is that no one can do this. <laughs> but you're just content to just point out everyone else, teach I correct the foolish. I'm God's gift to the church. And I don't want to shine it into my own heart. And just quickly, I'm going to move through this. He's going to grab three commandments to just show the principle. And he grabs the eighth commandment. You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You just keep preaching to everyone, you should not steal. And I'm just sitting around stealing and coveting and stealing God's time. And all, all I am is just a little thief. You, just, you can tell everybody else, don't steal, but do you steal? You can say to everyone else, you should not commit adultery. But do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob, which is to sacrilege temples, to, to break the first and second commandment? They're stealing and they're melting down metal with the idols and selling them in the market. So you're saying, don't, don't, don't have idols. And while you're sitting here having this idol of greed and, and that's all you're about and you're stealing and, and selling it. And, and so here it is, is the just simple principle. You just want to tell everybody else how to live. And you think that's the end deal. And I want to deal with my own heart before God. So do you see what Paul is saying? All of your privilege and light, you're shining it, but you're not shining it upon your own heart. And you're, you're doing the very things that you're condemning everyone else. And this is the biggest hypocrite that there is. I, I'm just telling everybody else, you're going to go to hell. You're damned for what you do. And, and you just keep preaching and preaching it. And you think you're okay. Is that why God gave his law? Do you think you'll escape judgment by doing that? And the sad answer is there's many under privilege in the church and in Judaism in that day who thought that would be enough. And that's the burden of my heart to let no one die in privilege and doing this and feeling self-righteous and feeling like you're special and loved by God 
because you're just condemning and teaching and telling everyone else how to live for God. And so parents, do not train up hypocrites. I think the easiest thing in the church is to train up a hypocrite. And I was going to give you like 10 steps to train a hypocrite, but it just for Mother's Day, it seemed like a bit, a bit much. But I just, my exhortation is don't teach your kids that their heart is good and everyone else is bad. What Romans is teaching me is your kid needs to know that, that, that their heart is bad. And it's desperately in love with self. And unless it's saved, it will perish. And so use the law to tutor them to Christ, to show them that they can't keep it. I've said it before, every summer I'd sit down with my kids and say, man, I got good news for you. There are only two rules in the house for the summer. And they used to get big smiles and be like, yes. I said, okay, love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And they would get up so happy. And the rest of the summer, they were so sad. Because everything they did, I would just keep showing them. Do you see why you need a new heart? This is why you hit your brother. This is, you just keep going and again and again. And instead of saying, you're such a good boy, Taylor. Thank you, buddy. As, Taylor, you need a new heart. Your heart loves yourself. It doesn't love God and others. And my whole goal the whole summer is just to, to keep showing you again and again to tutor you to Jesus Christ for salvation. Instead of coming out of the summer going, I'm a good kid. And my neighborhood's full of bad kids. Thank you, Jesus, for my privilege. I'm a pastor's kid. I got privilege. No, you got salvation. Because your heart is worse than any other heart because you came from Adam. And so there's Parenting 101 is don't teach your kids that they're good. Teach them that they're bad and they got to be born again. I had an aunt and she came and Jordan was just 18 months and she goes, you're just so sweet and good. He goes, no, I have a bad heart. And I thought she was going to throw me out the door. Teach it. (laughs) It's God's word. And they need to know they got a bad heart and they can't change it. And all their behavior keeps coming out of a bad heart. Don't change behavior. Don't just try to morally get to the heart to show them why they do what they do. And there's a savior for that stubborn and rebellious heart. And little kids, please don't be happy with being hypocrites. (laughs) Don't be happy just smiling and getting approval and, and, and looking down on everyone else. Get saved. Come to Jesus for that bad heart that you can't stop sinning with. Let the law tutor you to Christ this morning. You can't keep it. And it was given not as a ladder, but as a mirror to show you who you are, that you would flee to Christ. So teaching everyone else and discipling them and not keeping the law cannot save you. And it doesn't make God like you. It increases wrath, according to Romans 2.5. Thirdly then, what's the big deal? What's the result? And man, this matters so much this morning. If you'll look with me in verse 23, <clears throat> you who boast in the law, through your break in the law, do you dishonor God? Do you dishonor God? This is the verse, really, this whole section leans on. The religious, with all your privilege, teaching everyone else and not applying it to you, do you dishonor God with the whole world that you're condemning in chapter one? Chapter one, they dishonor God. Immoralities, adulteries, all of that. They're dishonoring God. But here's the boomerang. You are dishonoring God. Romans 1.21, they see creation, they won't give God glory. They won't honor him for what he's due. Condemn. You're condemned for that. Let's come to Romans 2. This is the great issue of life. The great issue of this world and universe is there's a God. And everything exists for his glory and for his honor. The chief end of God is... It's to glorify himself. Do you remember back in Romans 1, 5? Why are you writing? I've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith 
among all the Gentiles for what? (laughs) For his name's sake. This whole letter is that you will believe this gospel and live into this gospel that God would get glory as a savior from this depravity and all that we're looking at in Romans 1 through 2. So get this. This is the section of condemnation. This is the section of why we are condemned. And why are we condemned? Something very specific that God is telling us in Romans. Look at Romans 1, 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor, glorify him as God or give thanks. In verse 23, what did they do then? They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image and the form of corruptible man and the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They, they exchanged this glory of God for the image of an image of an image. And now look at Romans 2.23. You who boast in the law through your break in the law, do you dishonor God? And then look at Romans 3.23 that we know well. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the condemnation of all of mankind. And so the issue here, it's the glory of God. The glory of God is what matters. The word for it is kabod, which means weighty or heavy. And I just think we've lost this, that God is glorious and majestic and and weighty. And we will never have a revival unless it is us by this gospel that thirst for the glory of God by the obedience of faith, believing his gospel and living into it and obeying him. That is the glory, what gives glory to God. And so the definition of sin is that which dishonors God. What is evil? John Piper said, feeling, thinking, or acting in a way that treats God as less than infinitely valuable and infinitely satisfying. There's the issue at stake. That is the, what is going on in this world everywhere, preferring everything other than God is sin. And that is what the Jew, the religious person is doing in this passage. When you take all the privilege that God has given you, the Bible, the gospel, and you teach it and you proclaim it and you rebuke with it and you don't do any of it. He says, the Pharisees, you don't even lift a finger. You keep tying up everyone with what they should do and you won't even lift a finger. When this law doesn't tutor you to Christ, you fake it and you preach at everyone else and you judge them and your life's a mess. You know what you do? You dishonor God. That's what's at stake here. God is not honored. And religious hypocrites and and people suppressing his glory and exchanging it for the image of an image of an image. That's what's at stake here. God's glory. Having the law and teaching the law cannot change your heart to love God and want his glory over all else. It won't produce that. Pharisees don't have that in their heart. They need a new heart. So what, are your, what you are doing is defaming the name of God when you rest in privilege and don't get saved. If you go back to Romans 5 and just work backwards, no obedience of faith entering into this gospel and believing it and receiving Christ and letting that change you and begin changing you from one image of glory to the other, there's no glory. God gets no glory. You'll never be able to let your light shine in such a way that men see your good deeds and do what? They they give glory to God in heaven. So resting in your privilege and saying, God is really happy with me. You're in big trouble. Do you feel the weight of this passage? Look at verse 24. For the name of God, he's going to quote from Isaiah 52 here. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it was written in Isaiah 52. In the literal Greek, it says this. For the name of God, dia, which means through, the name of God through you, 
religious hypocrite is blasphemed and this preposition N uh, in the Gentiles. So remember that circle we said that God can bring you into the realm of salvation. So it's, it's, you're brought into the, to the realm of Gentiles blaspheming God because of you. So Jews, you've been set apart and, and you're to shine and show forth God and his glory. And the very opposite is happening because you're, you're, not, you're using the law the wrong way. You're not getting saved. You're resting in it like it makes you special. And because of that, you're, you're a Pharisee. You're a hypocrite. Number one reason when I share the gospel that someone rejects it, I know this Pharisee. I got a guy at work. He's a, he's a phony baloney. He comes in and talks about God and he's cheating on his wife. I, I just, they're always walking around going, you're a Pharisee, you're a fake. And the, the Gentiles are blaspheming God because you're saying, man, I'm the light. I'm the corrector of the foolish. You're wrong. You're condemned. And you're just nothing with your life. You didn't get saved. So all that's happening because of it, God is dishonored and blasphemed among the Gentiles. So I want you to hear something real clear. <clears throat> when God created you, He made you for His glory. And He made us as image bearers to reflect this glory. And we're different than anything else in creation. I love it. We can reflect God. And that's the glory of humanity. And so we were made to be these reflectors of God. And then the fall came. And it's been broken. And now in Romans 3.23, we all come short of the glory of God. We were all made to be reflectors of the beauty and the perfection of God. And now we're all broken and we suppress a general revelation and live in our sin and drink it up. And we get the law and we just poke everyone else with it and never deal with ourselves. And we're hypocrites and phonies. And he's just saying that every one of us lack the glory of God for the way that we were made. And then there's this amazing hope. Jesus said, I'm the exact representation of the Father. I'm the radiance of your glory. So God sent his perfect son and he is the perfect glory of God. He came and he fulfilled that law and perfect righteousness. He finally did what we were made to do. He just reflected God perfectly because he is God. How glorious and how beautiful is the glory of Christ. And we're right back at Romans 1.17. There's a gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. And then all this condemnation, and we come back to, there's a righteousness that you can get apart from the law. And it's going to be this glorious one who came and manifested perfect glory. And I love this gospel by faith. I will plunge you in Christos a hundred times in the New Testament. By faith, I will plunge you into the glory of God in Christ. And now you will not come short of the glory of God. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, eight people sitting here right now in Christ. You don't lack the glory of God. You're glorious because you're in Christ by faith. And now you can be in the presence of his glory and not be consumed like a chip in the midday sun. But you can stand blameless with great joy in the, in the glory of God. Don't ever stand before this glory with just privilege or law pointing at others. By faith, we come to Christ with nothing. And we believe his work on that cross to pay for our sin. And we're plunged and wrapped in his perfect righteousness. And now none of us lack the glory of God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to glorify God. And now what we are as sons and daughters is we're to go and reflect his glory. As now we can, because we're no longer just big old hypocrites. Our hearts have been melted at the cross and he, he gave us new ones. 
And now we got hearts that really do love God and love others. We're so different than anything in this world. And we go now and our calling is to reflect the glory of God. And as we move through Romans, that's what the rest of this is going to be. Is my, my purpose now is why he made me. And I just want to go reflect the power of God changing and transforming a life and shining a little bit of the image of who he is. And now we're having an image renewal day by day to look more and more like Jesus Christ. And there's this flesh that remains, that fights it and battles it. And it keeps us groaning in Romans 8 for the day when we're finally going to be able to perfectly reflect God for all of eternity. We're going to shine like the noonday sun in heaven. And so, guys, the end of this whole journey is going to be beautiful. But in, in the meantime, I just it matters that we dishonor God and the Gentiles are blaspheming God if we're religious hypocrites. And so this is a call. I'm not saying, I told you this before, there's a difference between being a hypocrite and having hypocrisy because we all have hypocrisy, but we see it, we deal with it, we're repenting, we're asking God to take it away and we blow it at work. We go to someone and say, I just want you to know I, I, I want to ask your forgiveness. I sinned against you. Have you ever heard an unbeliever do that? <laughs> they don't. So it isn't even a call to perfection. It's a call to be one who, who repents and seeks God and, and you're real. You're just genuine. And when the world sees genuine, man, they're just drawn to it because that's the image of God that they're seeing. And so go and reflect and show Jesus Christ to a dark and dying world. Amen? So for Mother's Day, children, put down your toys again. Don't come short of Jesus Christ. You have so much privilege with a mom and dad who are teaching you about Jesus. I, I've got teenagers and college people who are rebelling against parents who weren't perfect. And I'm telling you right now, they did their best to tell you about Jesus. And I, I want you to stop that. That's suppressing the truth. And I want you to take the privilege that you're hearing this this morning. You got a Bible and God gave you breath and life again today. Whatever age, don't rest in privilege. Jesus has come to me all who are weary and heavy laden of trying. You know how gross it feels to just sit and judge everybody all day and, and be a phony? It's a miserable feeling. I did it. And so today there's rest for your soul. Come to Christ and be saved. Don't live in Romans 2. Live in the fullness of a, of a salvation in Jesus Christ. So moms, we, we love you. And I, I pray that you could get alone now and some of your children might want to surrender their lives to Christ instead of resting in privilege. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, the beauty of a, apostle inspired by your spirit who loved grace so much he would just keep plowing. He wouldn't just kind of scratch the surface. He wants hearts to, to see what they really are and to be opened up and hurt so bad that they would flee to Jesus Christ for healing so good. Oh God, let no one die in privilege without Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that anyone who has never come to Christ, they, they've rested in Southside Bible Church, they rested in preaching, but they've never rested in Jesus Christ. I pray this morning, God, let them fall at his feet in faith and receive the fullness of salvation. Let them be in the glory of Christ and that they will no longer lack any glory. Oh God, thank you. And now use us. Use us as these little beacons to reflect your glory until you call us home and we will shine like the noonday sun. God, we long for that and we look for that. Thank you for the hope of this gospel. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.